Today we're going to discuss on injunction. But before going into the specific topic of injunction, we need to understand about um, what or when we can apply uh, as a parties when we can seek for equitable remedies. So basically, uh, you know that in this subject, we have discussed about the position of equitable and legal title. Um, the same thing when it comes to remedies, there are legal and equitable remedies. So legal remedies is basically that you are very familiar um, when it involves the claim for compensation. So basically, the third line when it comes to equitable remedies is when money is not enough. So basically, the parties will apply first for the compensatory or compensation. So if compensation or monetary compensation is enough, then there is no need to go for equitable remedies. So the first thing first, before the court can allow the parties or before the parties um, seek for equitable remedies, they have to think of whether uh, composition, monetary composition is enough or not. If the answer is yes, then it will be not necessary to apply for equitable remedies. So we have several types of equitable remedies. Right, that we'll, we'll touch on that later. So equitable remedies is basically um, is granted, if you know, if you go back to the history of equity, where um, Equitable remedies are granted at the discretion of the chancellor or at the judges or in the hand of the chancellors. Equity relies, uh, you, everyone knows that equity relies on less on precedent but more on the conscience. So when the judge would like to grant a particular remedy, uh, the party can apply but if you look at the wording of the statute, in Malaysia, equitable remedies is provided under uh, the Specific Relief Act 1950. So originally, it's based on conscience, meaning that we look at the English cases before the court can grant the remedy. But now the remedy becomes statutory remedy because it has been regulated or it has been provided in the Specific Relief Act. So you have to look at the provision under the Specific Relief Act for the relevant remedies and support with the cases. The cases can come from English and also Malaysian cases. Um, as I touched just now, um, that equitable uh, remedies are granted when legal remedies or composition are not enough or cannot be adequate remedy. So um, in equitable remedies, we can understand that the purpose of the parties looking for equitable remedies is not money. Money is not the aim of the party. But the purpose of equitable remedies is to, for instance, if you take the example of equitable remedies, okay, number one, for instance, we'll look at specific performance. So the purpose of specific performance is to um, request or seek the order of the court to request the parties to perform the contractual obligation or the specific uh, part of the contract. Okay, that's speed performance. And we have also injunction. Injunction is to prevent another party from doing something or to order a party to do something. So injunction can be both mandatory and also preventive uh, injunction. You can ask the, a party to do or not to do something or to cease from doing something. Okay. Um, for injunction, we have other types of injunction like Mareva order, we have uh, Anton Peeler order, we have Quetime injunction. Just to give you some ideas, um, and we have also like the remedies that you have discussed in the law of contract before, like recession, declaration, ratification. Okay, uh, so like for instance, we talk about. Um, Take one example, basically like Mareva, Anton Pillar, Kwatime and uh, Arringford injunction, there are all types of injunction, but uh, the type of injunction, every type of injunction here apply for uh, specific circumstances. For instance, like Anton Pillar order, it is a search order. For instance, when 
um, the defendant refused to disclose a certain information that may affect the right of the plaintiff. For instance, um, we have a case of breach of trust, but the trustee who is the defendant, uh, the, uh, the document or the grant of title, the deed of title is in the possession of the defendant. So the defendant refused to disclose or to share the document with the, uh, with the court or with the plaintiff. So uh, what the plaintiff can do is that the plaintiff can apply for, uh, mare, for an anthem pillar order to order the defendant to disclose the document, the, the deed, the grant title, which is in the possession of the defendant. Okay. So basically, when you when you apply for anthem pillar order, it's a search order, it's a discovery order. You can ask the other party to disclose uh, the document which is in the possession of the defendant. All right, um, Mareva order. It is also a type of uh, injunction. Uh, in short, uh, we call it as a um, asset freezing order. Okay. For instance, very um, familiar or very uh, common in the case of um, in the case of money laundering, okay, where you can apply for a court order to freeze the asset of the defendant. Basically, uh, we know that as we discussed before, equity as in person name where you can sue the person anywhere, right? But here is um, is actually well, where, okay. In a legal action, you have, um, you can take action based on where the properties are located, right? But basically you can, a Malaysian court, a local court can only have jurisdiction if the property is located within the territory of Malaysia. Lah. But what if the property is located outside Malaysia? Can, and can a court order be, be enforced or be granted against the defendant? Yes, through Mareva order. Mareva order is a asset freezing order against the defendant, uh, against the defendant's property located anywhere or in any part of the world. Especially when it involves serious, serious cases because injunction is basically granted when it involves serious case, right? So, um, for equitable remedies, the court may uh, issue an order to against the breaching party to deliver some actual property. You know, this can be the case of uh, restitution. It's part of equitable uh, remedies too. To stop doing something that he should not do. This is, for instance, in the case of injunction. Or to return the consideration the non-breaching party gave so as to return the parties to the pre-contract status. So this is to enforce the terms and condition in the contract as agreed by the parties before. So you can um, refer to the injunction like specific performance, injunction and also restitution. So today we're going to look into the meaning of injunction, the definition of injunction. Number two, we're going to look uh, into the types of injunction. But um, for the other types of injunction like Erinford, Quetime and Mareva, we will discuss in the next lecture because there is already quite a lot of discussion on uh, interlocutory injunction in general as well. Already, sorry. So you just need to understand the principle of uh, the interlocutory injunction first before we go into the specific types of injunction. Right, so what is injunction? Injunction, um, we know it is a type or a category of equitable remedy. Injunction is based on right in personam, not right in rem. So in equity, we know that an action is based on right in personam. Equity acts, equity uh, acts in person M. That's the first equitable maxim that we learn under the topic of equitable maxim. So the same thing applies for injunction, where the purpose of applying for injunction is to 
enforce a court order against a person. So, uh, bef so the court will look at where the person is located and then enforce uh, the order against the person. So it is not an order against a property. Where is the location of the property? So the court will assert, for instance, a court in Alusta uh, can enforce injunction where the uh, defendant uh, is located in somewhere in Kedah, for instance, because you know the court situation is according to the local jurisdiction. And even though the property may be located somewhere in Kuching, for instance, but since the party is in Alostar, so the court, the High Court in Alostar can uh, have a competent jurisdiction to hear the case uh, on injunction against the defendant. An injunction is a judicial process by which one who has invaded or is threatening to invade the right legal or equitable of another is ordered to refrain from doing or to do a particular act or thing. So it's a judicial process, meaning that uh, it is a court order. You can only enforce your right by way of court order, number one. Number two, it can be in the case where the defendant, where the defendant has invaded or has potential to invade the right. has potential to invade the right. So the right here can be legal and equitable right. For instance, okay, we have very common example of A, B and C, the owner, uh, the trust, um, or the owner, the settler, the trustee, B, and um, a beneficiary. Here, um, when the owner, A, the settler has died, uh, the property supposed to be transferred or conveyed to C, right, as the beneficiary. But the problem here is um, C has the knowledge that B uh, is going to convey the property or transfer or dispose. When I use the word, it's all the same thing as, because it means that it involves transfer of title. Where B intend to sell the land to a developer to gain profit, then only he would will give the property in the benefit or for the benefit of beneficiary. So C here, having knowledge about the uh, intention of B, C can take action against uh, B, even though there is no legal right yet in the uh, property, but because there is already an intention to make a trust in favor of C. So C already has the equitable right or equitable title in the land. Therefore, C can, can take action on injunction to prevent B from selling or disposing the property to a third party. Okay. Um, that is what we call as preventive uh, injunction where you uh, prevent the defendant here, the defendant is B, the trustee, from selling the property, the land, to a third party. Okay. Uh, next point that we need to understand is that injunction is not a separate cause of action. So, in the case that um, we discussed just now, Trust is a form of contract. So you can take an action under breach of contract. But uh, to bring a specific, to, to claim for damages alone here is not enough because uh, C can only get the compensation, right? But C wants the land. So uh, to preserve the status quo, what is the status quo here is that C will be transferred. Uh, the status quo is when B would transfer the land in favor of C as the beneficiary. So that's the 
that's the cause of action. But in order to enforce their right, they can um, apply for injunction. So injunction is not a separate cause of action. It is actually to support a cause of action. Right, in the case of IMSA Malaysia, Sinian Berhad and Bank Muamalat Malaysia Berhad, um, the court said that an application for an injunction is not a separate cause of action in itself, but merely an ancillary claim unable to exist by itself. So basically, in law, uh, as the plaintiff, you need to have a cause of action first under the um, under the under the law lah. Either you want to bring under contract injunction can be can be brought under uh, under contract or tort. Okay, basically that's all. It can be also under constitutional right. You maybe you have come across few cases on injunction before when you did constitutional law before, like in the case of government of Malaysia and Lim Kit Siang, that is under judicial review. Okay, and the contract law you may have come across as well for breach of contract where the plaintiff uh, apply for injunction to prevent the defendant from disposing uh, the property or um, relinquishing or destroying the property uh, as an evidence. There are many ways where the defendant can do with the property, right? First, um, the defendant can sell the property to a third party without the consent. So that is wrong. To stop the defendant from doing that, the defendant, the plaintiff can apply for an injunction. Or there may be circumstances where the plaintiff uh, knows that the defendant has the intention to destroy the property, like in the case of um, like in the case of Anton Pillar order, where uh, the, the plaintiff can apply for anti pillar order is a type of interlocutory injunction or injunction. The purpose is uh, the plaintiff needs to apply for anti pillar order to avoid the defendant from destroying the evidence. Okay, in that case, um, the example that we discussed just now is the the deed or the grant title, or maybe in the case of Mareva in Mareva order when um, if you already know that the defendant has a certain asset like money share or bitcoin whatever property nowadays there are so many type of property um, because basically you cannot interfere with the um, other people's account right here the plaintiff can have a right to take injunction under mariava order against the defendant to freeze the asset so that the asset will not be what we call as dissipated, the asset will not be gone because of illegal uh, conduct of the defendant. If the asset is gone, then you cannot take action against the defendant, right? That's why you need to freeze the asset so the defendant cannot um, dispose the property to a third party, the defendant cannot um, destroy the property uh, so that the defendant can be taken action, for instance, under money laundering. Okay. Right. Um, this is another case where the case of Ipsma just now referred to, where the court um, in this case, Lord Deplot said that it is not a cause of action. The purpose, the right to obtain an interlocutory injunction is merely ancillary and incidental to pre-existing cause of action. It is granted to preserve the status quo pending the ascertainment by the cause of the right of the parties and the grant to the plaintiff of the relief to which his cause of action entitles him, uh, which may or may not include a final injunction. All right, it's a long quote for this uh, judgment. Um, the first, uh, the one that I put in italic just now, number one that we need to understand is that um, injunction is to support cause of action. Number two is to preserve the status quo. So, for instance, just now the defendant, um, the plaintiff would like to take action against the defendant, right? The beneficiary, C, would like to take action against B. So, injunction is necessary so that B, the trustee, will not destroy the evidence. If no evidence, then it will be difficult for C to prove that he has, uh, or the beneficiary has right in the property.
status quo that's what we mean status quo status quo means um the agreement between the parties between the a b and c that c has been given or a has um a has give a has agreed to give the property in favor or for the benefit of the beneficiary so that is the status quo so when you apply for injunction you want to maintain that status quo otherwise if you don't take injunction then it will be difficult for the party to maintain the status quo why the question is why injunction why not just ordinary trial injunction is a special circumstances an injunction is granted in very exceptional and special circumstances meaning that it is an immediate and urgent urgent action that the plaintiff need to take so if the plaintiff goes through a normal a uh, procedure or proceeding then it will probably that the plan, the 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 plaintiff cannot get or cannot preserve the status quo here basically injunction happens before a real trial because a real trial a full trial may take time right so over time if you wait for full trial uh, then it would take time for any time the defendant can uh, destroy the the evidence or can uh, affect the rights of the of the plaintiff right so there are a few types of injunction basically there are four types but if you look at um here the first two types preliminary and permanent injunction this is what we call as the duration of injunction so preliminary injunction is basically pending trial pending real trial um and in Uh, a temporary injunction or preliminary injunction some people also call it as we will discuss later as interlocutory injunction interlocutory injunction or preliminary injunction can be applied at any time during the trial it can be before the trial during the trial but before the final um, award of the injunction okay for permanent injunction it is granted during Uh, a full trial and the effect is is a permanent injunction preliminary injunction is just to preserve the status quo pending full trial or pending the finish of full trial but for permanent injunction is granted to uh, permanently or perpetually award um, the order preventive order for the uh, plaintiff right the another types or category of injunction is preventive versus mandatory injunction so preventive is like uh, an order to stop the defendant from doing something it's a negative in negative way right uh, in negative injunction but for mandatory injunction is an order to uh, order the defendant to do something so that is a positive injunction or positive act positive order So for the remedies we refer to the specific relief act in particular for injunction section 50 of the specific relief act if you have um, a copy of specific relief act please have a look now this is basically uh, taken directly from the provision um, in this section it provides that preventive relief is granted at the discretion of the court by injunction temporary or perpetual So as we have discussed briefly just now at the beginning of this lecture um the history of equitable remedies is at the hand or in the hand of the uh, chancery so it is a discretionary uh, matter meaning that preventive relief can be granted on the discretion or by the discretion of the judge So the effect can be temporary or perpetual. Right. Let's look first at um preliminary injunction or temporary injunction. You can also call as interlocutory injunction is all the same thing. Section 51 subsection 1. Can I have um Miss Bahul? Are you there? Muhammad Misbahul 
Misbahul Munir. Are you there? Okay. Afnan? Yes, sir. Uh, Afnan, can you uh, help me to read section 51? Uh, okay, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, for section 51, uh, temporary injunction uh, such as uh, to continue until a specific time or uh, until the further order of the court. They may be granted at any period of a suit and are regulated by the law relating to civil procedure. All right, thank you, Afnan. So this section um, tells us briefly about the meaning or the definition of temporary injunction. Number one, it is a uh, preliminary injunction can be granted pending a, a full trial or pending a final determination of the court, fi final uh, hearing of the court, right? Number two, it may be granted at any period of suit, meaning that the plaintiff can apply and the court can award the remedy at any time during, uh, before, during the trial proceeding but it must be before the final hearing or final determination of a case. So if we go back to the example just now uh, between A, B and C on the breach of trust, breach of trust is committed. So here in the case just now, it's a breach of contract. Okay, that can be uh, a cause of action. Breach of trust also can be an action because there is a contract already between the parties between A, B and C that B we need to transfer uh, the land in favor of C, right? Doesn't matter if it is a constructive resulting trust that I won't go into the details. Okay, so it can be granted default. The full trial is for the breach of contract or breach of trust. So injunction can be applied at any time before the full trial starts. It can be before or during the trial. Okay, and the next point, number three, it is regulated. Temporary injunctions are regulated by the law relating to civil procedures. As you will learn this in, you will come back to this topic again in your in the subject of civil procedure. So injunction is also governed under the rules of court 2012. The, uh, especially on the procedure to apply for injunction. What are the documents that needs to be prepared um, for an application of injunction. So in the subject of civil procedure later, you will uh, study on the procedure of applying for injunction. For this subject equity, um, the thing that you need to understand is when we can apply for injunction, when the court may grant or the court may not grant an injunction. There can be situation where the court may grant and there can be situation where the court may not grant an injunction to the uh, plaintiff. Right. Uh, preliminary injunction is a provisional remedy. Provisional means temporary remedy that can preserve the status quo existing to preserve the subject matter means preserve the status quo of the plaintiff. The purpose is to prevent dissolution of the plaintiff's rights. So basically, it to preserve the status quo. It's because the plaintiff, in the case of A, B, and C just now, the plaintiff is applying or is suing. Um, the plaintiff can be both A and C. If, if A has passed away, C can take action because C already has equitable title. So C can take action on under his own name, on his own against B. So the main reason we apply uh, for preliminary injunction is to the need for immediate relief. Remember that I mentioned about the sense of urgency, the sense of um, uh, a time now. That's why we apply for preliminary injunction because we need to be quick, we need to be fast. Otherwise, the defendant might uh, destroy or might uh, affect the right of the plaintiff in the property. Right. Next type of injunction is perpetual injunction under section 51, subsection 2. May I call? Okay. 
Uh, Nur Anis Shahira. Anis, are you there? Anis Shahira. Anis Shahira ada tak? Okey, tak apa. Syukri ada. Syukri, Muhammad Syukri. Muhammad Syukri bin Samsu Anwar. Aisyah, Aisyah Khairuddin. I did sir. Alright Aisyah, can you um, help me by reading the session for the class? Can you see the slide? No, uh, no sir, I, I cannot see. Oh, you cannot see the slide? Okay, can, all right, never mind. Uh, what are you using? Are you on your laptop or phone? Okay, never mind. Lukman, can I have your assistance to read the session? Lukman Hakim. Lukman, are you there? Okay. Can you uh, read the section, please? Section yes, 1, section 2. Perpetual uh, induction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon the merit of the suit. The dependent is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of a right or from the commission of an act, which would be contrary to the rights of the pen. All right, thank you, Lukman. Um, so in the case of B, A, B, and C just now, the C can apply for both perpetual and temporary injunction. So the one that we discussed just now previously is on interim or temporary injunction. The plaintiff can also apply for perpetual injunction. Perpetual injunction is granted at the hearing, meaning that the court will need a full proceeding or a full trial to look into the grant of or the award of a perpetual injun uh, injunction. So when the court award uh, an, a perpetual injunction in favor of the plaintiff, the defendant will need to, uh, to the defendant is forbid or is, for, is, is, uh, is stopped from doing something like forever lah because that is permanent injunction. But for temporary, the effect is only for certain period just to preserve the status quo pending the final determination or finding a final determination or final hearing of the trial. So in the case where you have two injunctions here, where the plaintiff apply for perpetual, but at the same time he also apply for temporary to preserve the status quo, perpetual injunction and uh, temporary injunction are separate. It does not affect each other. So the court may, uh, for instance, the court may award uh, temporary injunction in favor of the plaintiff, but after considering whole evidence or every facts of the case, the situation of the parties, the court may not award perpetual injunction uh, in favor of the plaintiff. So it, it, it can be two different decisions, even though um, you can, because a perpetual injunction where the court will consider, the court will look into, take into account all more facts and more longer proceedings. Right. Section 52, subsection 3, this is where uh, the situation of perpetual injunction may be granted. For instance, these are um, the situation for the 
for the subject of equity and trust, uh, you can actually take um, all those as long as it is relevant to the uh, facts of the case. It could be where the defendant A, where the defendant is a trustee of the property for the plaintiff. So just now B is the trustee, B has breached the trust, C and A can sue uh, B on breach of contract or breach of trust. Or B, where there exists no standard for ascertaining the actual damage caused or likely to be caused by the invasion. All right, for instance, in the case where the defendant is planning to, um, to sell the property to a third party, but it's not sold yet. It's just the document is being prepared. So... It is not because if you want to claim uh, for compensation, you need to prove damage, right? So there is no damage here, right? There is no actual damage. So without actual damage, you cannot claim for compensation. But you can still have your remedy in equitable remedies. For instance, you can claim under injunction, okay? Because there is no actual damage. So you cannot claim for compensation. Right. Number three, when the monetary compensation, when the pecuniary compensation is not enough. So this is uh, going back to the basic of equitable remedy when money is not enough. You know, when money is not everything. Lah, because the plenty sometimes does not want money or money is not enough because the plenty wants to preserve the status quo or the reputation. That's another thing that the plenty may consider to, when applying for equitable relief. Uh, D, when it is probable that compensation damages cannot be got for the invention. In some circumstances, uh, damages cannot be the compensation. For instance, like in the case of if we go back to the, you see, remember when we discuss on tenancy couple with equity. So when um, the the landlord uh, terminate the tenancy, in the case of proprietary estoppel, where the plaintiff has cultivated on the land and there is a promise already, so compensation cannot be the remedy. So there is. In that case, the plaintiff can apply for injunction. Or when there are multiple proceedings. For instance, um, in the case of, we can take the same example of A, B and C, where B has sold the property to D, and then D also a subcontract or sublease or tenancy to uh, X, for instance. So, Injunction is important to prevent a multiple claim over the land so that it has uh, the claim by the plaintiff first need to be entertained before the other claims uh, is heard in court, in the court of law. So injunction is somehow can be um, an action to stay or to, pre to stay the proceeding or to, 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 to prevent um, multiple or cross proceeding over the same matter because the land is subject to the land is claimed by different parties. Right, this is just for your uh, understanding. Actually, under section 51, there are a long list of uh, illustration or example that you can look for for, for further understanding. Um, for instance, illustration B, A, a trustee threatens a breach of trust. His co-trustee, if any, should, and the beneficial owner may sue for an injunction to prevent the breach. So here, the breach of trust does not happen yet, right? There is just a threat. So there is a potential act of the trustee to commit breach of trust. Even it's just a potential act, it's just a possibility, the uh, beneficiary or the beneficial owner can take action, can take injunction against against A in this case to prevent the breach because injunction is a preventive relief before uh, something or actual damage uh, will happen or, or would occur. 
Alright. In another illustration, we have A and B, where A uh, about to make imprudent sale of a small property of trust property. So in this case, uh, it's a case of breach of trust too, right? Is about to make, meaning that A is still planning. There is a possibility. So here, before the actual act of selling happen, B can sue A for injunction to restrain the sale. So you cannot claim under legal remedy because there is no sale and there is no money coming into A's pocket yet. Right, so legal remedy would not be possible. Um, so for that situation, B can sue A for injunction for the for the potential sale of property without B's consent. Right. Next, we're going to discuss on preventive and mandatory injunction. So in general, basically, injunction is a preventive relief. Right. Preventive means uh, is an order to refrain a party from doing something or from doing an act. So under section 4, subsection C of the Specific Relief Act 1950, there are few circumstances where specific relief may be granted by the court. And one of them is under clause C, section 4, clause C where uh, specific relief may be granted by preventing a party from doing that which is uh, which he is under an obligation not to do, meaning that um, a preventive relief may be awarded to prevent a party from doing something, the defendant basically from doing something. Right. Next is mandatory injunction. In some situations, uh, we can also apply for mandatory injunction to command a party, whether it is a plaintiff or defendant. It can be both. Yeah. Uh, injunction can be also applied by the by either party, including the defendant, to perform certain act. Under section 53, it says that when to prevent the breach of an obligation, it is necessary to compel the performance of certain acts which the court is capable of enforcing. You can say that a mandatory injunction is quite similar to specific performance because it's an order to compel the performance. But of course, specific performance is not a form of injunction. Uh, you apply for injunction when there is something imminent, something urgent, something immediate that you want the court to preserve the status quo, right? But for specific performance, there is a different discussion on that. But the nature is to compel the performance of certain act. All right, for instance, um, under this section, we have illustration A, where A obstructs light to the access and use of which B has acquired right by prescription. B may obtain an injunction not only to restrain A from going on with the building, but also to pull down so much of them as obstruct B's light. So here, what would you think of the possible cause of action here? Because injunction is not a cause of action. Who can guess? What would be the possible uh, cause of action here? Anyone? Any idea? No sense. Okay. Sorry, Shukri? No Nuisance. Sense. All right. Nuisance. Okay, great. It can be a case of nuisance. Very good. So, the cause of action is nuisance. The remedy that you can apply is mandatory injunction or injunction okay okay next is the example of when interlocutory uh, or man interlocutory mandatory injunction basically when we say it is interlocutory because uh, for few reasons number one uh, it is an immediate urgent relief number two uh, because it is urgent so uh, the proceeding is held in chamber. In chamber means it's a closed proceeding. It's not, it's not held in open trial or in open court. Right? Number three, because it is immediate, so the court will only grant the remedy in rare or special circumstances or exceptional circumstances. Right. In the case of Shamsuddin bin Shaikh Jamaluddin, 
in this case, the court lay down what are the requirements of interlocutory mandatory injunction. So first, you must prove you must give proof by giving affidavit evidence. Affidavit evidence is like a sworn statement. Nyataan bersumpah lah. Right? Number two, the case is clear that the case will be in favour of the plaintiff. Number three, the court will look into if the court grant the remedy, the plaintiff will be have right uh, over the injunction. All right. So, um, briefly speaking, for mandatory injunction, it will be granted only in exceptional and extremely rare circumstances. And um, it can be applied by way of ex parte injunction. Ex parte means uh, when the plaintiff go to court applying for injunction, not only for mandatory but also for other types of injunction like um, interlocutory injunction. Of oh, sorry, preventive injunction. Uh, when we say interlocutory, that means the plaintiff, the court, uh, the, the the high court judge can decide the case for an interlocutory order based on the evidence submitted by the plaintiff only. That's why it is, it is enough for the plaintiff to um, tender uh, affidavit evidence. Nyataan bersumpah sudah cukup without the attendance of the defendant. So meaning that the court can, the court can, uh, uh, the court can grant order to the plaintiff in favour of the plaintiff based on the evidence submitted by the plaintiff, even though without the attendance of the defendant. That's what we call ex parte. Okay. Well, for full trial, like for perpetual injunction, so for ex parte, basically in the case of um, interim injunction or Temporary injunction right is the same thing, right? But for the case of perpetual injunction, it must be inter parte. Inter parte means the court will hear the evidence of both parties, plaintiff and defendant, before the court decide on whether to award or not on the perpetual injunction application by the plaintiff. Right. Any questions so far on uh, the types of injunction? Sir, yep. Uh, I do Daniel. Ex parte application tu, mm -hmm. uh, application yang difilekan sebelah pihak, uh, kan? Macam tu ke? Betul. Sebelah pihak lah kalau bahasa Melayunya, dan dia boleh di, uh, di dimohon oleh plaintiff atau defendant pun dua-dua boleh dalam kamar sebab tu dipanggil in chamber ya. Dan uh, the other party tak perlu diberitahu pun oleh mahkamah. So the court may award uh, an interim order, interim interlocutory order without the presence of the another party. Uh, satu lagi sir, mm -hmm. kalau kita, kalau lah uh, Malaysian court uh, grant Mareva injunction kan, okay. uh, untuk uh, account yang ada dekat luar negara, Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Island ke Lepas tu macam mana siapa yang akan enforce uh, injunction tu Right, that would require the cooperation of Interpol okay, clear, sir. Because it's not easy to Well, um, if you have an account For instance in a foreign bank Even in a, in a Malaysian bank um, We know that you cannot get access to the another party's account without a court order. So only Mareva order can allow um, the plaintiff to have access to the defendant's account. If you apply through a normal proceeding, you will not be allowed because uh, a normal order cannot be um, a normal order cannot be enforced outside the Malaysian territory. But for Malay, for Mareva order, it can the order can be enforced worldwide. But if you look at in terms of the enforcement, of course, uh, normally, um, it, for instance, in the case of money laundering or breach of trust, where the property has been put in a secret account, uh, normally, like normally the famous bank would be Swiss bank lah. 
because your account will be really protected. But if you have Mareva order, Mareva order is one thing, but another thing is to enforce the order. Somehow you need to have the assistance of the uh, Interpol lah, because it can be, uh, if it is a money laundering, it's already a case of international crime. Even though it is initially the case of breach of trust, but if the money is used for illegal purpose, you can take action. Uh, you, uh, you need to have the assistance of Interpol or the yeah to, to enforce the order. But in principle, Mareva order can be enforced worldwide. Okay. Zudin. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Any other questions before we proceed? So I will stop this recording first and start with a new one for the next topic.